Welcome back, everyone. I am Tiffany. I'm John. Today we have with us a very special guest. What is your name? Corbin. This is our son, Corbin. Thank you guys for coming back and tuning in with us, learning all about our lives. Today he's not feeling well, so he's going to be in and out of here. But we're here. It's 2024. Transparent, the real, the raw, us. You guys have so many questions that you've been asking about what happened the day John was injured and so forth. I mean, it's been a really long four years. So we actually have pictures today to show you to answer a lot of your questions. All right. So let's start from the very beginning. The day John was injured, it was around 11 a.m. And I received a call from his coworker. I thought it was a joke. Corbin was about a year old and we were taking a nap on the couch. Zero. Yeah, Zero. you were one. And we were taking a nap on the couch yeah. and I hung up on the coworker and I thought it was a joke. He called back and he was like, this is not a joke. You need to get up. The trauma hawk is coming. So I immediately jumped up and was like, okay, this is real. I think I packed a water bottle or two water bottles, a pair of underwear, and my phone charger. <laughs> and <laughs> that was it. I was frantic. So I got hit Corbin's bag ready, and I dropped him off. <laughs> and I hit the road. We were about 45 minutes away from the hospital. And I think I made it there in like 20, 25 minutes. I actually passed a cop on the way and was like, hey, can you get me through some intersections? And he thankfully did. I was like, it's an emergency. And so when I got to the first hospital where John was trauma hawked, I ran through those doors and was almost tackled by security. I was a lunatic screaming, where is he? Where's my husband? My husband's here. Security was like, well, I need your name. I need his name. We need to figure this out. <laughs> um, once they let me through the doors, I was told that he was rushed into emergency surgery, that he was receiving a tracheostomy in his neck to help him breathe. And they immediately placed me with the pastor. I knew that at that point it was extremely serious. I was all alone. There was a regular phone in this room I was placed in, and I picked up that phone, and I started calling my mom. And, yeah, my mom lived out of state and told her what had happened, and then friends started showing up. And probably the longest hour of my life went by, and they finally brought John out. And... He was completely hooked up to I, IVs and lines, and he had all kinds of writing on him and a brace and cuts. And yeah, it was just the beginning of the craziest ride of our lives. I was handed his wedding ring in a bag, and I lifted his body onto the trauma hawk. Um, they basically told me, they gave me two options and they said, we can take him to Miami or we can take him, I believe to, um, Jacksonville. And I picked Miami and for whatever reason, I'm so glad I did. So yeah, once he came out of surgery, I saw him, kissed him. They gave me his wedding ring and I walked outside of the trauma hawk with them and begged them to let me ride and they wouldn't. Um, and so I physically helped lift his body and one of his friends drove me down to Miami. I'll show you guys some pictures now of how John looked before the accident, before I get into what he looked when I saw him for the first time. So this is actually a picture from the fair, one of my favorites. Our daughter was really little at that time, but you see John's ears and his hair. He never really had long hair. Yeah, I never, I've never had long hair. But I believe this is before we got married. So probably 2015, 2016, we were probably 
25, 26 at the time. Let's see. This is our engagement picture. You can see ears and just shaved hair. This is our wedding rehearsal. Hmm. That's me. Hello. A picture of John at work showing me how huge the rock was. And another picture of John at work. So now we'll show you the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the no, crazy the bad stuff. stuff. Yeah, the bad stuff, right? So when I walked into the hot well, when I saw him when he first came out of surgery, this is what he looked like. Yeah, make sure you your arms are longer. Oh, it's hard. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to watch this and do that. So that's what I saw. Completely that's scary. Rough, huh? Uh huh. So why were your eyes were closed? They were no, sleeping. Oh. So that's from the first hospital. Took me about two and a half hours to get down to the second hospital, and his life flight was only about I want to say eight minutes in total. Um, when he got to the second hospital. I was immediately rushed, when I got to the second hospital, I was immediately rushed with proxy <laughs> papers. You have to sign as a proxy and make all medical life-saving choices. That, that was just a week before my 30th birthday that this happened to him. So being 29 years old, I had no idea what the hell I was doing, but I knew that his life was ultimately in my hands. Every choice I made for him from that moment on mattered. Um, so that was extremely scary. I actually still have that proxy paper that I signed that day. And then I was not allowed to see him for a very long time. I'm not even sure that I saw him. No, I did see him. So yes, when I got to the hospital, it was nighttime, probably around 5 or 6 p.m. 5. They had him in what's called recess. So it was downstairs in the hospital and I managed to get my way through those doors. Doctors and it's a hospital full of residents. So there are people everywhere. Managed to get my way through those doors and found him. And I found everybody working on him. And I remember them yelling at me again. And I said, I'm not leaving. And I put my hands by my side and I stood at the wall and I just watched. And I knew at that point how serious that this really was. They let me stay for a few seconds and then I was escorted out. And then I don't believe I saw him again until the next day because they took him obviously up to the trauma ICU. So once I did see him, this is what he looked like. He was completely swollen. His eyes were swollen shut. He was in a coma. <laughs> and they were bracing to assess his, his wounds. The electricity entered on the right side of his head. 4,160 volts of electricity. And I believe it was the second or third day where they brought in the neurosurgeon. And when he came out of surgery, he had a brain bleed and a skull fracture. So they needed to see how badly his skin was burned. They ended up taking a bunch of pictures and showing me. And this is very small, but the surgeon brought out his phone and showed me that's the exit wound on the back of John's neck. So it's not very big, but he's a third and fourth degree burn survivor. So it's right there. <coughs> so once they showed me those pictures, <coughs> they were really nervous about how they were going to proceed with removing the skin on his head and everything. 
They did a lot of debris first on his shoulders and his neck because it was all pretty deep. Mm -hmm. His neck was actually obviously the worst besides his head. His shoulder was pretty deep as well into his muscle. But yeah, I don't remember everything exactly, obviously. It was so much chaos happening in the first week. But he was in a coma. He actually woke up the day before my 30th birthday. <coughs> he wrote to me. Sorry. We appreciate you guys hanging with us. He wrote to me on his whiteboard. Said, I will be here. I love you. Happy birthday. This whole thing, this is hard to figure out where to put it in the middle. So I printed that and saved that. Relax. Baby, you can't keep running back and forth. So I printed that and saved that. Hold me. I am holding there. By the time he woke up, he had already gone through, I believe, one, two, three, at least three <laughs> surgeries in the first week. And he's been through over 30 in the past four years. So once they started, once they started figuring out, you know, how deep his burns were and everything, they removed the skin on his head. They removed the skin on his head and his shoulders and they replaced them with skin grafts from his own body. So... Well Yes, they. So I did see in the comments somebody asked if I had donor skin for my skin grafts. My skin grafts that you see that are healed came from my body. So they put the your skin grafts down, and then they put donor skin grafts on top of mine to help them heal better. So I did have donor skin only for a short period of time. So while they were assessing his skull and what they were going to do for surgery and stuff, they started with the skin grafts on his arm and shoulder and neck. So they kept his head wrapped. And a lot of you are curious about his ear. <laughs> Come back a little bit. There. His ear was completely charred and white and dying. So you also see his cheek there is very wet. That was all this. It, it would just all out to here. keep melting off. And luckily he didn't need any um, skin grafts on his face, on his cheek. Yeah, it was crazy. You could take like a paper towel and go to clean it and wipe and all that skin would just come right off. And it, like she said, it was like it was melting off my face. Uh-oh. Nobody is talking to you. <laughs> yeah. His phone does that randomly. It's very weird. But then here's another picture of once they did graphs on his shoulder and what that looked like. And they started assessing his ear because I think they knew that eventually he would lose it. A little bit. But every time he went in for surgery, they would take a, a small piece at a time. Oh, no, oh, no. Pictures of his skin grafts from his own body. <laughs> that's my leg. That's his leg. You can imagine how painful that was. So for those who don't know about skin grafts or have never had skin grafts, um, it truly is absolutely amazing on how they do it and how it works. So as you can see, they cut that. I need you to move, Bob. Yeah. So they cut, okay. you know, they cut the skin off. But they take it so thin that your hair is still on here. Like, the hair is not gone. So it was just wild how it works. And it does. It feels like road rash really bad. So you'll see pictures. <laughs> More skin grafts. That's during the healing. They can see right there. It's during the healing. He would pick off 
the skin and it would be like snake skin all over the hospital room. It was hard. I ended up getting a mop, a Swiffer and a broom and was... I would clean before the cleaning lady came in the room because it was disgusting. It was, was so all over my room because once, I don't, I don't know about you guys, but once I have like a scab and I pick it, it's like addicting, you know, you just want to keep picking it. So I would, and I would just throw it on the floor because I didn't want it in the bed with me. It was disgusting. And it was everywhere. There was so much dead skin. So here's another picture. His head was wrapped again during this time. It stayed wrapped for over a month. They wanted us to water his head every day like a plant. So they would bring in saline water and we would pour it through the red tube at the top. And it would, yeah. And it would trickle down and keep his head moist. Right there. They would, yeah, just hit it and just squirt saline and it would all cover in my head. Very strange. And I really couldn't even feel, you know, the water or anything touching because I don't really have any feeling up here anymore. So during that time, we were really blessed that while they were waiting to see what they were going to do with his head, John was allowed to go outside of the hospital. He was allowed to get out of bed. He was allowed to walk out the front doors. And on campus was a Starbucks, McDonald's. Panera. Panera, Pollo Tropical. And then, yeah, it was, it's amazing. Jackson Memorial Hospital affiliated with University of Miami. They're basically the same place. <laughs> Incredible campus. So at Ryder Trauma Center at Jackson Memorial, where he was admitted, they have a rule that says you are not sick, you are injured. And truly, that is what saves these patients' lives because we were going insane. And the fact that he was able to get out and walk around was just the biggest blessing. So I walked around the hallways on the same floor, which is a big square. I would walk that hallway all night, all day to stay out of my room. So when they finally did let me outside, it was like, oh, my big relief. It was nice. It was nice to get outside. As you can see, our son is just a little over a year old, but... We were all oh, over. Dad. Stay back. You're making a blurry. That was you, Dad. That's only you. Here he is oh, eating a... You're making me hot sitting here. Go. Breakfast croissant outside of the hospital with his wound back. That was after surgery later on. But just to show you, we were able to go outside and do stuff. Here he's sitting in his wheelchair before his head surgery again with the tubes in it. So now I'll take you into, they eventually removed all the skin on his head. They knew what they were gonna do. They had told me that they spoke with other hospitals who have dealt with patients like this before. As you guys can imagine, people like this don't live. John died twice. He was revived. His life was saved. And now they didn't know what to do with him, how to reconstruct his head. They ended up doing what's called burr holes. And these holes were maybe the size of a dime all over his head. Yeah. And maybe a quarter inch thick. I'd say all over the size of it's all over his head. Okay. I'm going to go change the TV. Sure. And they wanted to see how strong his skull was from the entrance wound all the way around. When they peeled all his skin back, they realized that the electricity bounced around. So all of his skull was burned in different spots. So the burr holes showed us, you know, if, the skull was going to be able to live or if they'd have to completely replace it or do a titanium plate or what was going to happen. And at that time, we were excited to find out that John was eligible to just use his latissimus dorsi muscle from his back, his lat muscle as a head flap. So that was his, his surgery for that was the day before Halloween. But I have pictures here of John seeing himself for the very first time and us seeing him for the very first time. 
with his skull exposed before his surgery. So if you have a weak stomach, you might not want to watch, but that was him the first time. Looking in a little mirror, his skull was open on the right side. He had grafts over the rest of it. Here's another one with his skull open. That was the entrance point on the right side. You can see the black spot is where the electricity went in and the little holes around it, the burr holes. The back of his head at that time was covered with grafts. So all of that skin is actually what's called cadaver skin and it's donated. Stone. So you'll see the color on the skin and that tells you what type of donor it was. If you are not an organ donor, please consider it. We're both organ donors. We've been long before this happened and we will always remain organ donors. John had, I believe, seven blood transfusions through yep. all of this. And it was just extremely scary. Yeah, by the time I got out of the hospital, my blood wasn't even my blood anymore. <laughs> yeah. So this is actually the coolest picture we have. This is one of the lead surgeons at Jackson Memorial Rider Trauma Center. And he is standing up talking with him face to face it's... with his skull exposed in the hospital so, room. At this time where he is staring at me, talking to me, he actually did tell me. That well, you're basically a dead man walking. Pretty much. Like <laughs> he said, I have never seen anybody get hit in the head with that much electricity and stand in front of me and talk. So he said, most of the time, you know, the people, they just, you don't make it. Yeah. So he said that was very incredible that I was able to stand there and have a conversation with him with my skull. <laughs> and it was wide open, which mind you, a lot of the nurses in, uh, residents in the hospital are students so they're you know they're learning and they're they're seeing new things it was scary for everyone so people would walk in my room and they would see my head wide open with my skull all exposed and to watch their faces they'd walk into like, oh my god yeah and then they didn't you know they're second guessing is this the real is this the career i want to be in right now so i had to learn how to do everything because i would see that these residents and nurses were kind of scared and intimidated by yeah. this so the doctors would write their orders and they would tell me exactly what i needed to do and i never left john's side during this i was at the hospital every single day all day long slept in chairs I slept in chairs like a cat yes. literally and if the children came down on the weekend i would have my father or my mother or somebody would fly in town Somebody would stay with John at all times because, like I said, the nurses were intimidated, didn't really know what to do. So I would just say, wait for me to get back. I'll do it. They taught me how to change his inner cannula for his trach because this crazy person, oh my God. So, well, so if you haven't had a trach, then you, you, you know, you, you don't understand but if you have had a trach, then you definitely understand that when it's in your throat, that tube that's in there can get clogged up. And since I had all kinds of dirt and grease and oil, soot, soot all in my lungs, <clears throat> I would keep hacking stuff up. He aspirated. So they were constantly cleaning his lungs out in the ICU. Yeah. But since I had a trach it would never make it to your mouth to spit anything out, anything like that. So it would, you know, it would get stuck in the tube. And actually one time, and I'll never forget this. Never will I forget this because I couldn't stop laughing. I thought it was hilarious. Not funny. Well, what I'm about to say, she doesn't think she's thinking something different oh. is when I was laying in the hospital bed and I had to cough. And I went like that and a loogie shot out of my trach and it hit the foot of the bed Disgusting. like a missile. I remember. And I couldn't stop laughing because I just shot a loogie out of my throat. So gross. And it was very funny. But what she was talking about was, so it does, it would get stuck. It had, you know, get blood dried in it, loogie or whatever. So they would take it out and change it. Well, I told 
one of the nurses that it was getting hard for me to breathe because it was clogged up. And she said, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll change it. Well, she didn't come back. So I took it upon myself to pull it out of my it's own like neck. It's like the middle of the night, by the way, when he <laughs> did this. Pull it out of my own neck. And I decided, well, I don't have another one to put in. So I'll just go wash it out in the sink. So I walked into the bathroom in my room and I washed the whole thing out of the sink. And right about that time is when a nurse came in. She said, what are you doing? And I said, well, it was clogged and I need to breathe. So I'm washing it out. And she said, you can't put that back in. So she went and got me a new one. But they couldn't believe that I took it out and was washing it myself. Yeah. So from oh. then on, I would carry them in my pockets. They trained me how to change it. Yeah, they were like gold and, in the hospital. Yeah, they would run out. Yeah, it was hard to get your hands on them. So, so there are certain sizes of inner cannulas too because, you know, from children to adults and everybody's airway is different. Yeah, Tip would have them in her purse. Yeah, just crazy. Because in case we were walking and you were on campus, I'm like, oh my God, God forbid something happens and he starts choking and I have to change it. Then this man had multiple feeding tubes. Let's just say we had to rip one of those out in the middle of the night, too, because he started choking on That's, that. Yeah. So I don't know how it happened. And the doctor, he said, I don't even know how that happened. That the feeding tube, you know, it goes in your nose, goes all the way down into your throat, and it goes down in your stomach. Well, it ended up working its way while I was laying in bed, like up to here. And I could feel it. And I started choking. And then just that feeling of choking, I started to panic. So I stood up. I got out of bed. And I was like, it's choking me i need to get this thing out and everybody's like no 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 don't pull it out don't pull it out well then figure it out you know get the doctor in here it well, was the, in the middle of the night so, so they were calling the on call they couldn't get the doctor fast enough and it got to the point where i got so pissed off that i was like well fuck it i ain't doing it no more and i just pulled it out of my nose he was gagging choking <laughs> throwing up and it was only like that far in so it was literally like right here in my throat so they did they put a brand new one down my throat which is absolutely horrible to do you know, they say, oh, it's real easy. Just pretend you're swallowing water. Yeah, no, it's not easy at all. You're trying to swallow a whole tube going into your nose down into your stomach. Crazy not pleasant. Crazy story taking you backwards again. In the ICU, you know, he couldn't talk. He was hooked up with the trach and everything. This man is asking for the nurses for coffee through his IV because he wasn't able to eat. Yeah, so, yeah, I couldn't talk <laughs> at all. fix the lighting. Keep going. I couldn't talk. And I was, I was in the ICU, I was laying there and I just looked up, you know, from laying on the pillow, I look up and there's nurses gathered right outside my, my room and they're all handing out Cuban coffee. And the guy holds up two more and he's like, I got two left. Anybody want one of them? So I couldn't yell, Hey, bring that to me. So I kicked the end of the bed. He turns around and I told him, put in an injector, put it into my feeding tube and I'll take it. They wouldn't do it though. Yeah. Yeah, it's better. So it's hard to get the lighting right because my head's so shiny. Yeah. Lots of crazy experiences in the hospital. Definitely was memorable. Mm. So going back to the cadaver skin, which is organ donor skin, you can see more burr holes on John's head before they went through with the surgery. And you can see where it's darker in some spots where the electricity right. bounced around. I'm going to have to get closer with that one. Well, it makes it, it's blurry. So you can see holes. Yeah, they're all. And you see that his skin on his shoulders did not look like they do today. Show yeah, they ended, up, they ended up keloiding really bad. So... As you can see now, see how it's all bumpy and rigid like that. And he did have, well, about a year after is when he got fitted for compression garments. And it was just, yeah, he well, wasn't they, having it. Well, it was awkward because, you know, my face didn't get burned and they have compression garments for if you have ever had your face burned, you can put them on. But my face wasn't burned and the compression garments they had made for me. They weren't tight on my neck. They were tight on my face, but not tight anywhere my scars were. So it didn't even work. So I was like, I'm not wearing this. And it was almost like a crop top. It zipped up and down yeah, and it was a crop it. top. And we have a picture of that, but it's too embarrassing to show. <laughs> I mean, if you want to show it, you can. We'll just move forward. 
So John's had reconstruction. They ended up shaving down all the burr holes, making it smooth again. That's why it's deformed looking too. Just as you can see, I mean, you can see that it's like this whole section is lower right. than over there. But his skull appeared to be hard and fine when they went to do his head yes. flap. Yes. That was actually the day before Halloween. So our children came down to the hospital, brought a pumpkin, carved a pumpkin in our hospital room with them, and they wished Daddy luck. And that is where the longest surgery took place. He was transferred oh. to the main building in Jackson Memorial where they it's the surgery ICU. And that surgery was 12 hours. I paced back and forth in the lobby floor, inside, outside, just did not know what to do with myself. The longest ever. Yes. So out of the surgery, which before the surgery, they told me my back would hurt because I asked, you know, what kind of pain am I going to be in? You know, every surgery I have some sort of crazy, crazy ass pain. So I, I just asked him, you know, just so I was prepared. You know, what kind of pain am I going to be? Where is it going to be? You know, they said, well, your back is more likely is what's going to hurt the worst. And I was like, okay. They said, your head probably won't hurt at all since all the nerve endings have been burned off. And I was like, that makes sense. Well, that was bullshit. When I got out of that surgery, I mean, the only way I can describe it, and I mean, this isn't even probably close to the feeling, was to put your head in a vice crank it down as hard as you can and then just let somebody beat the back of your head with a bat. I mean, that's probably the most pain I've ever had to endure in my life. So that whole area that I was in like was a nightmare. No clocks on the wall, no windows, no doors, no rooms. You're all together pretty much. Between shower curtains. Everybody that was in this whole area was, was unconscious. Yeah, they were. I was the only one that was up and awake and talking. So they also, in this picture, you'll see it, and I'm going to show you. It's called a bear hugger. And the only way I can describe, because you can't really see the whole thing, is think of like the cheap rectangle pool float. Like for your whole body. Yeah. Like you're okay, going to so lay it long. On, okay. You can put your whole body on it. They run hot air through that and they just place it over any part of your body that needs the blood to be circulated because, you know, they, when they did the lap muscle, they had to sew in all the blood vessels. I actually think she sewed them in from this side. She, they had to pull it from your right yeah. side to your left side. Yeah. So with this thing on my head, with no windows, no clock, no nothing. I want to say it was your artery that she pulled. It could have been. And with all the drugs I was on. Yeah. I literally had no clue where I was. Couldn't tell what time of day it is. What day it is. And just completely disoriented and have no clue what's happening in my life. And it was like the most... It was... I couldn't, it just best way to describe it is a nightmare. So the thing on my head... Is what I'm talking about. And that just places over it. So now when you have that over and you're all drugged up. This is all you see out of is like this. And you can't even look around at all. And it was just like terrible. Yeah look how swollen that whole side of my face was. So the yellow stuff on his head is called zero form. And that is the nastiest smelling, smelling stuff it's ever. Gross. But they had it lubricated. His lap muscle on his head. And so, then they had it covered also with bandages that you'll see. What? We're listening. So his I've face seen, on the side is still melting as well during that. But that's right after right, his show that one. construction. Oh, and yeah, then yeah, after yeah. this picture, I'll tell you a story about this. Go ahead. So I want to say before, before your head surgery is when they finally took your ear. It was not at the same time. No. No, it was another surgery. That so, ended up just cut the thing off. Right. I think by the time he left the hospital, he had maybe seven surgeries. So, yeah. 
you have a weak stomach, you might want to turn away. His face would just ooze and goose. And okay. So out of this, moving. out of the head surgery, you know, my face was like this. That's my ear. Okay. And at one point that was almost covered. Like you couldn't even see the ear hole anymore. So the last video that you guys watched with us talk, starting to talk about this, she talked about uh, burning the top of my head. With yes, after his what's it called? Silver nitrate. Silver after nitrate. his surgery, I would have to burn him with silver nitrate. Okay, so silver nitrate it's chemically burns your skin. My face looked like this. He panicked because they thought she thought they did something to my ear hole, and she panicked and said, "Where the fuck is his ear?" Oh, they're like, "Well, his ear's gone." They're like, "No, where's the hole? Where's the hole? It's gone!" Oh my god, what did you guys do? So one of the students at the time goes, "Oh, it's right here," and he picks up which silver nitrate comes on a Q-tip, mm -hmm. a long Q-tip, and he took it and goes, "It's right there." And he went to go do that, and I saw it out of the corner of my eye, and I slapped his hand. And I said, "Whoa." That is not a Q-tip. And he was like, oh, no, yet. And he looked down and seen it. And he goes, oh, no. I was like, you would have just burned the ear in my, the whole eardrum, everything would have been burned up. So thankfully, I saw that. Let me take you back for a second. When we realized that his skull was strong enough to go through the surgery after the burr holes, the reason for the burr holes that they did was to see if tissue would granulate around his skull. Yes. which means that your body naturally repro can reproduce tissue, which would have completely covered up his entire skull again. Yeah. But they said it was taking too long. I believe we had waited two weeks for that. And they would come back every couple days and they'd unbandage him and check and see if any little pieces of pink tissue were sprouting basically in those burr holes. And it did in some areas, but it wasn't fast enough. fast enough. And that's why we would water his head. So they said, you can either sit here in this hospital, basically for a year, year of your life, just sitting, waiting for your tissue to come back, or you go through with this lat muscle as a head flap. And that's why we picked that. His skull was strong. His lat didn't seem like such a concern. You know, he has always been pretty confident. And to, now, today, he can do push-ups. He can do a pull-up if he wants. So, truthfully, it was... Pull-up's a little difficult. I mean, that is that is what your lat muscle does the most is when you go to do a pull-up, That's you're using your lats really a lot right there. Right. Push-ups, not very much, but I can do... Now, I can do a couple pull-ups. That's about it. Right, but you were, you know... you. I couldn't even put my put, push my ass up on the bed when this happened. Yeah. I couldn't after, even use my arms. After his head surgery, I mean, it was a, it took a long time to get where yeah. he is now. Yeah. But what I'm saying is you regained your strength in yeah. the best way possible. And that is the answer to most of your questions is why he didn't do a plate is because his skull was strong yeah. and his lat was the best option rather than sitting in the hospital for an entire year. We had children to go home to. He's screaming. So... I'll wait for him to come back. I'll show you a picture of what his head looked like when he saw it for the first time after all the bandages came off and they started checking the pulse in his head. So they had to make sure that there was blood flow all around his flap because the risk of it dying was like a 50-50%. If it would have died, they would have had to take his other muscle. If it didn't work, then that's where the titanium plate would have come in or sit in the hospital for a year. This is what he looked like after his head surgery. It is ginormous. You can see that the muscle is all over his head. He had tubes in his side and the long thing on his back is where they cut the muscle out of. When he saw that and I saw that, we both just immediately started crying. They said that it would be huge, his head, and that it would shrink down. 
So just like if you're a bodybuilder or, you know, you work out, you have muscle. If you stop using that muscle, that muscle shrinks. Okay, one second, guys. What did you give him for medicine last? Nothing today. So then Motrin, 7.5. Do you want to switch with me? Nothing. All right. So doing real life, guys, it's unfortunately always something. If you stop using your muscle, your muscle will shrink. Same thing with his lap muscle on his head. It was big and within six months to a year is when it started to shrink. So he was very self-conscious, conscience. And on campus, there was a nursing store. And so I went down there and I was like, I wonder if I can find some scrub caps or something that could possibly fit his abnormally sized head. They were the nicest ladies in there. They ended up giving them to me for free. I bought matching ones so, so he wouldn't have to feel alone in wearing this ginormous scrub cap on his head. And when I brought it to his room, he was so excited, you know, walking around campus with that on his head. We were just terrified because it was such a high infection risk while his head was healing that it just gave us a little bit of peace and comfort to be able to cover it up. So when we, when he basically passed through the, his clearance, right? His head flap, pulse was great. Blood flow was great. Everything was working. They were like, this thing is perfect. You know, you guys have the option to stay a little longer or you can leave. We elected to go to the hotel that was about a mile away. We stayed there for a few weeks. He was able to go to the lobby, get fresh air. We would go back to the hospital a couple times a week for checkups. And he had all his medication for pain there. Here are some pictures from the hotel as he was in the very beginning stages. You can see where they cut the muscle out of his back. The L part is where they took a skin graft for his head. So not only did they take him from his legs, but they took it from his back as well. Here's his tubes on his side. He needed that to drain the blood from his back. And when they were full, I'd have to dump them out. I'd also have to keep track of how much blood it produced and make sure that air did not fill up in there. Here's another picture of his head. How raw it was in the very beginning. It's good. But... So, uh... oh. A funny story with uh, this. So as you can see, which a lot of people ask if if my head will grow hair back or whatever. So if you look, I don't know which light it is, but it's really not helping at all. If you look, you can see that that is my hair. Okay, so that that spot does grow hair. And uh, I shaved that because I would look really stupid with one spot. Just beautiful hair coming out. But on the back, that was my hair. The black is what you see. That's my hair. And that did. It, it grew right here. That's the only place. It started to grow. Well, when it got to the point where it wasn't tender, she would tweeze it out of me. So I told her, just pick all that hair up. Because I would get really bad ingrown hairs in it. Yes. So we'd pick them out. But when my head was like this, that was so tender and was so painful that I couldn't put my head on a pillow. So what I would do is we would wrap my head and then take the biggest women's pads and put them on the back of my head just so I could ease my head onto a pillow. And I mean, then it was still, once it was on the pillow, I didn't move. And 
so there, it's hard to describe. If you've ever dropped a pencil and you go like under a table and you go grab it and come back up, you have that sense that something's above your head. And I don't have that anymore. So if I have to get in a car or something, I have to physically know like, hey, the door's there. I have to watch out. There's no like sense that you get that it's there. So when my head was like this is when I started realizing I don't have that sense anymore. But when I would be laying on a pillow, my head would feel like it was being pushed through the pillow. It was a very strange feeling. I've never had that. I don't really know how to describe it, but it was because of the nerve endings are all gone. So it was very strange. Oh, you showed the JP tubes. Yeah. So go Perfect. ahead and explain this guy. I'm just listening for our son. Poor guy is not feeling well. No, he's not feeling great. And he's medicine. The new year is here, and we have so much planned for you guys. All right, go ahead. If you check out season one, we have a very special guest. And truthfully, this guy saved us in more than one way. This is my main man right here. This is Keith. And, uh... I can't explain how grateful I am that I was able to meet this man. So I was in the ICU and they asked me, oh, my TV didn't work in the ICU. So I was like, hey, my TV's broken. And they were like, oh, well, the maintenance man's right down the hallway. Do you want to walk? Because I love to walk. So it's, it's okay. The hell was they said, you know, do you want to walk down there? I was like, yeah, I want to get out of this room. So this nurse took me down the hallway, and sure enough, here's Keith just hanging out. And I said, hey, you. And he said, hey. I said, you're the maintenance man? He goes, yep. I said, my TV's broken. Okay. So he followed me back. He fixed my TV. And then from then on, he was like, hey, what? do you know what room they're going to transfer you upstairs? I was like, we don't know yet. He was like, all right, all right. So the next day went by, and then the next day, and all of a sudden, here comes Keith. Just walks into my room. What's up, dude? We hit it off. We start talking, and he started hanging out. And when they transferred me from the ICU to the burn uh, floor, he would come in my room like every day, hang out. Um, and if you watch the podcast with him on it, you'll notice that the well, you'll, you'll hear that he is an amazing baker. He likes to bake pies and brownies and all these treats. So he would bring in all this stuff. And uh, when I was upstairs in the burn department, my room, the AC ended up, uh, it wasn't working right. So I asked him, can you fix that? He said, yeah. So here he is fixing the AC, there's Keith right there. And he brought his whole crew up to fix the AC. And he fixed it. And the uh, the manager for that floor, her door was like right there. And her AC was broken for like a week and they didn't fix hers. And she was really pissed that they fixed mine instead of hers. So it was very funny. What else pictures does she have here? Let's see. This is my back, all bandaged up. So you see that cut right there? I don't know if she explained it to you. I think it's, there was another one where we can see it better. Yeah. So this cut right there, that was the burn. Let me see if I can show you. So I don't know if you guys can see, but right there is this little burn right here. That's pretty much what was on my back. And it was really irritating when I was laying on the bed. So I asked them before one of my surgeries if they could just put a Band-Aid on it because the bed was irritating it. And they're like, yeah, 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 we can do that. Well, when I came out, that's what it looked like. They didn't put a bandage on it. Since they were teaching students, they taught them how to cut 
the burn out and sew it back up. So instead of just having a small scar, they gave me a bigger one. <laughs> but I mean, all in all, you're not really upset with being there. What? Their practice, right? Oh, like their guinea pig? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was a pain in the ass, don't get me wrong, but I have nothing at all bad to say about my doctors. I mean, they did what they could. We made with... amazing friends with most of the residents. Yeah, I mean, but they kept our spirits up, too. Like, my main doctors, like I told you, the one we showed you in that picture of me standing with him, he explained that this doesn't happen. So they don't even know how to begin with somebody that's alive and looks like how I did. And then my main... My other burn doctor, and she didn't tell me until I was out of the hospital like a year and a half later that she was, you're my first patient that I've ever done anything like this on. I was like, that's really reassuring to hear now. But she did an incredible job. My plastic surgeon did an incredible job. Neurosurgeon. My neurosurgeon. I, I mean, I can't. The doctors I had were the most incredible people. And, and they had to call everybody in because it's very hard telling the story over, you know, over from the very beginning, giving you guys every single detail. His eyes were swollen shut. He needed his eye cut um, in the yeah, ICU. Please. That's why one of his eyes are a little smaller. Oh, this is right, right there. And if you look, right there, that, that eye is like just a little over. It's weird. He has like an open eyeball. pocket. Yeah, yeah, open eyeball. But his organs were failing. His lungs were full of gunk. Everything. He aspirated. It was just the craziest thing. So, I mean, there's much more than what we're telling you guys, but you guys are so curious about his head <laughs> reconstruction. And this was obviously the most important thing of all because you can't just walk around with your skull hanging out. So. Oh. Once they saved him, got his organs working again, the head surgery was super intense. But your motivation? Well, my motivation is my kids and this one. But I had a bunch of motivational. I don't know. I, I don't know how, what to say with that. Just motivation. Like my Harley or my stretching my arms because I have big ape hangers. And they used to tell me in therapy, like, what makes you want to move your arms? I was like, to ride again. So they would always stretch my arms to stretch out all that scar tissue. Do you ride? No. That's the shitty part. <laughs> right. He thought I worked he was my going ass to. off to fucking get, <laughs> get back to where my arms would sit on my apes. And now the bike just sits and it's for sale. So if you want to buy a Harley, let me know. Oh, <laughs> seven bad boy. <laughs> so... The day before this happened to me, my daughter was asking me over and over for months, Dad, I want a go-kart. Dad, I want a go-kart. Dad, you know how great a go-kart would be? You know what would be great? A go-kart, Dad. We had just bought our house. So we had an acre and a half of property that was all clear, no trees, so it was perfect. With a big fence, everything, so she could run the go-kart if she wanted to. So finally, I went on Facebook Market, and I found one for pretty cheap. Went and picked it up with a buddy. We brought it back. Checked it out. Drove it around the yard, me and Corbin. But because Corbin was a year old. Yeah, we're She was at dance. Yeah, that's what it was. You were with her at dance, so she wasn't even there. Right. So I was like, oh, I got the, you know, I call her, I got it. You know, it's pretty cool. It's gonna be great for her. Let me give it to her now. When you get home. No, tomorrow's a school day. I'm like, yeah, that's, yeah, you're right. Tomorrow's a school day. It's getting dark. And then I woke up, went to work. And then I, uh, I woke up in the hospital about nine days later. So after I got out of the hospital, I was finally able to, which she had no clue about this either. Yeah. The whole time until I got out of the hospital and said, hey, I have a surprise for you. And she said, you have a surprise for me? And I said, I do. So we went to the shop. And gave her her go-kart. And she was so excited. So <laughs> just so wound up about it, which was amazing. Because, you know, as a kid, that was all I loved. Was anything with wheels and a motor. 
We got her her helmet. We got her the gloves, you know, the goggles. She was ready. She I taught it. her how to drive it. Scary. <laughs> Which she she rode around about three times and then clipped one of the supports for the fence in the front and blew it off. Not me, Chloe. Yeah. And after that, she thought, first she thought she was in trouble. And I was like, you're good. I was like, the fence is fine. And I was like, you're okay. She said, yeah. I was like, then you're good. Keep going. I don't want to do it anymore. And that was it. <laughs> then the go-kart sat for like a year. And finally I was like, I got to sell this thing. So we sold it. So another cool story is John got to pick up his evidence from yeah, the police was, station. I thought it was so weird that it was considered evidence and put in the, the police department. We had to go pick up my pants and they cut my mm. favorite belt. I was very upset about my belt. So we went and picked that up. And when John was in the hospital, we had shirts made for him that said, I'd stare too if you got hit in the head by 4,160 volts of electricity. That's because more adults would stare than children when I was in the hospital. I mean, they would stop what they're doing to look at you. Yeah. And when, since you've been out of the hospital for four years, the amount of looks that we get still is uh, unreal. Yeah, which now I don't, even then I was like, whatever, you know. I made shirts for myself that said, didn't your mother teach you not to stare? Yeah. I would get super offended. You know, why are these people looking at this grown man like this? But now I don't. Yeah. I don't give a shit. It doesn't bother either of us. You can stop. You can have your mouth wide open staring at me. So if you watch <laughs> the podcast, all the other episodes, another incredible, our superhero, our superhero was on our podcast. If you've seen season one, you will meet Curtis. Curtis is one of the firefighters, first responders who responded to the scene He's that day. He is something incredible. He's amazing. He Him really and is. John are good friends and he lives near us and just one of the most genuine, As humble say, people. Yeah. When you talk to him, it's like you just automatically are attracted to be his friend and you just want to be his friend because he's such a good hearted person. Like, and then it's the guy that fucking saved my life. You know, you're, you're, you're like a fanboy over a grown ass man. You're like, <laughs> You saved me. I want to be your friend. I want to hug you. But he is truly an important person in my life and an amazing person. Yeah. He... And I can't thank him enough. And I mean, you talk to him about it and you sit there and you're like, you know, you saved my life. And he's like, well, nah, you know, <laughs> so I had to. You're like, All right. <laughs> I got paid to do it. Yeah. Just kidding, Curtis. He, yeah, he's an amazing dude. I love him. But yeah, we've caught up with him multiple times over the last few years. And he came on the podcast and he talked about how he feels every time he sees John, you know, walking around alive, talking, and how he thought that John was absolutely not going to make it. Yeah. So it was incredible getting him on here. Well, a lot of people, you ask, about how it happened and all that. It's hard to go through that story of how it happened because I truly, I don't know how it happened. I was working on a machine, a big piece of mining equipment, and that's where I was electrocuted because it runs off of 4160. But we don't know how it happened because I don't remember any of it. I remember waking up out of a coma. So, but a lot of people also ask, they also ask, um, you know, were you conscious? Do you remember this? Do you remember that? How was it to get you, you know, from to the ambulance, all that kind of stuff? If you watch his podcast, he tells his part of the story of how he saw me, what cut. he thought, how he brought me out, how he saved me. You know, how... he cut the clothes off John's body yeah. that we picked up at evidence. Like so. he told me that I was trying to talk and I was trying to stand up and walk away. And I was like, what? He was like, yeah, you, they had to get a hold of me and put me down on the gurney and tie me down because he said, you kept trying to get up and walk away. And then so. somewhere in the midst of Tomahawk 1, Tomahawk 2, John coded twice and was revived twice. Yeah. So it's just super surreal that John has gone through all of this stuff and our hearts go out to all of the families who we have heard from who 
their loved ones have passed due to electricity. It's very bittersweet that John is still here with us today. He has a traumatic brain injury. He's a third and fourth degree burn survivor. He's gone through 30 something surgeries in four years. Crazy depression, crazy PTSD. Which for everybody that comments, you know, on my TikTok or on our YouTube, <clears throat> when you comment and you tell us, you know, that your brother or your son or your father or your sister or your mother was hurt on the job or was electrocuted. I mean, I've seen some crazy stories on my TikTok that from the comments of, you know, other people's experiences through this. And uh, it really does mean a lot for you to comment and share your story because not only is it touching to me that you wanted to share that with me, but it's great for you to share it and get it out to the world to show awareness that this stuff happens more than people know in this blue collar world and just the craziness behind it. So thank you for sharing. I know it's not easy. So I just want to let everybody know that I really do appreciate when you do share your comments. You guys are truly helping us so much. And that's why going into 2024, if you've watched our first episode of this year, you'll see that we were real and raw with you guys about our marriage, our relationship, you know, this journey that we're on now is truly just so humbling. You guys are giving us your feedback. We're sharing our life with you now openly. It's just, we feel very inspired by the guests that we've spoken to, you guys sharing your stories with us. Oh, the guests that we've had on the podcast are like some of the most amazing people I've ever met in my life. And I mean, almost every one of them, besides what Curtis, Miles, Jerry that I've actually met in person. So, I mean, and it's just the most amazing people. Yeah. They've truly become family. Yeah. Family is what you make it. So guys, we appreciate all of your support. That was an hour of maybe seven surgeries and maybe I'll say like 30 hours of surgeries that I sat through on top of two months, day in and day out with John. There is so much more to tell you guys. So we will be back for our part two. Hang in there. Stay tuned. We appreciate the support. If you know what these are, we feel incredibly sorry for you. But these yeah. were a part of John's journey as well. If you don't know what these are, these are self-catheters. And yeah, we will be back to tell you guys the bad and the good parts of this journey. Obviously, the good is that he's still here walking and talking and able to openly share his story now. But it was crazy. And there was a lot of scary times and hard times. Definitely a lot of hard times. So we just hope that we can support you guys. And yeah. If you see him laughing, I swear it's the brain injury because he didn't giggle so much before all this. But he. That's all you can do now is laugh. Yeah, he's it's doing good. It's to the point where it's just. I don't know. I've said my story so many times that. I don't know. It's funny half the stuff to me now because what we went through is so traumatic that to look back at it and sit there. And I will tell you. So when Tiffany. What are we at? An hour and three minutes? So Tiffany, about an hour and five minutes ago, started getting all these pictures for you guys ready. Her concern was that let's do this now. That way I have the weekend to relax because every time I go through all these pictures and everything, looking at them doesn't bug me what whatsoever. I mean, looking at it in the hospital didn't bug me. I wasn't grossed out. I wasn't panicking. Is it a huge change in your life to have the scars that I have? Yeah. And to sit here and go through and look at all the stuff that I've been through, uh, it ends up bringing up like the PTSD part of it. And at night when I go to sleep, my brain will not shut off and it will replay all these images. 
And then once it starts doing that, it'll slip into like kind of like dreams of being in the hospital and what I've been through and the pain. And sometimes I can physically feel the pain in my body and then I won't sleep. And then I go into like high anxiety and, you know, I just go crazy. A lot. And it's very unfortunate, right? It's 2024, transparent, real, raw. John, if you saw our first video, we spoke about how he would wake up in the middle of the night, screaming. freaking out, screaming, crying, running, slamming my door open, scaring the shit out of me, the baby, himself, scaring himself. Oh, I mean, yeah. most of all, like he didn't understand what he was going through. He'd wake up with like, with like jolts of light in his eyes yeah. or Which I still, like I just said to you, I still get that. It's a huge part of why we needed to separate because I explained that a year ago at year three, the doctor said this is still very fresh for him. So now at year four, we're still on the same page as we were year three, two, and one. He still wakes up freaking out. I cannot go, you know, unfortunately, four years, five years raising two small no, children with no rest. Yeah, it's... So... She went through plenty in the hospital and then right out of the hospital. Like I said in the last video, you know, out of the hospital, I was a huge asshole. I was not nice to be But around. that's not what we're talking but, about. We're talking about rest. John needs his rest. He still calls yeah. me sometimes at one o'clock in the morning freaking out. I'll answer, but it's not an every day where I'm sitting there anticipating him coming in and freaking out. He, you've managed, you've done really well. And we're actually looking into a service dog now for you. Yeah. I've, I've gotten to the point where I can. So <laughs> before my accident for, I don't know. I, I mean, for me, at what I did for work how many hours I did, always on the move and all that. I never knew what anxiety was. I knew what work stress was, screaming at each other, throwing wrenches and all that shit. But I had never experienced uh, anxiety or PTSD. And when people say, you know, PTSD, the first thing you think of is somebody that was in the military, you know, that somebody in the service, what they've gone through, they have PTSD. So for a doctor to sit there and be like, hey, you have PTSD, I was like, well, that's bullshit. And he was like, no, it's not. It's 100% real. So it was very strange to hear that and very awkward to get used to that because I'd never experienced it before. So now to the present day, I've gotten to the point where when my anxiety starts to really rise, I kind of feel it and I can catch myself. And I'll tell her like, hey, my anxiety is like starting to climb. And if it gets to a point where I know that I start like fidgeting and I can't control myself, I take myself out of the situation. That way I know that I'm not going to get, you know, have a nervous breakdown with the kids and her and put it all on them. I'll go take myself to where I live. I'll relax, try to chill out. Or if my anxiety rips to the roof there. You know, it's great for me because nobody's around me talking, so I don't just start snapping out. And we don't understand why this happens. He doesn't understand, but it gets to the point where he says he can't control it. So it's really, it's really hurtful that this is what he's gone through. It's hurtful for the children because they don't understand why daddy starts screaming or freaking out, honestly, at random times. It's very unpredictable. We all still love him and care for him and try and nurture him and appreciate the awesome times we have with him, but we don't know what triggers his PTSD. And that's the truth. And it could be debilitating where he won't come and see us for a week. Every year around the time of his incident, he's basically debilitated in it's bed like for, for a couple of weeks. So we begin to look for a dog. A service dog and we are hopeful that hopefully in 2024 he will have a companion that can help him and he can love on and we can all love on but yeah guys we've told you quite a bit <laughs> it's over an hour we have corbin home who doesn't feel well i'm just so glad we were able to show you guys some pictures please continue to give us your feedback we absolutely appreciate the support 
We hope that you continue to respect the both of us and how we live our life. We will always love each other. We are just doing what we have to do and what we feel is best for our children. Yeah. And for all of you, you know, being vulnerable like this is not easy at all. <laughs> at all. <laughs> no, it's... I don't know. It's like I said, I, I don't to put my story out there was good for me to get it out and share it as much as possible and talk about it more and more. It does help me. And I really wanted it to go out there to help others. So that was a huge thing for me. And to start seeing how many people were responding to my, you know, my videos and commenting and you know, there. I can see when you guys share it or you save it, and it was just incredible. And same for me. I want all the wives to know that they're not alone yeah. who have had loved ones who have been injured. I have people reaching out, asking questions about his surgeries and recovery and his brain damage and all we've kinds had, of things. Yeah, we've had people reach out for advice. I mean, that's – it's crazy that you reach out for, to me for advice, you know? We're just regular people. <laughs> Joe Schmo over here. You know, I'm nobody important. So it, it does feel good to be able to help somebody because we've always liked to help people. Yes. And um, like when she said, you know, it's very vulnerable to be out there. It is and it isn't because, I mean. We've been locked up for four years, basically. Yeah, it feels good to put my story out there. But vulnerable as in like I'm going to get hurt. My feelings are going to get hurt or anything like that. It's. You're not going to hurt my feelings on the internet. You can say whatever you want. But when I did put up these videos, we I know I was expecting some crazy comments. I was waiting because I've seen all of the internet. And we were waiting for some comments. But You guys have been amazing. <laughs> the Truly. support has been absolutely incredible. Yeah, I've had some you know, small comments here and there that I think of two comments that were actually like, pretty hateful comments and i know one of them you guys fucking banned this person i didn't even do anything so it was awesome to see you guys stick up for me who you don't even know and uh i can't say it enough but i appreciate all of you you guys are awesome we love you all we really do guys this is where we're going to end. We can obviously talk for hours. I like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> he does like so, to talk. Yeah. But yes, thank you guys so much for your support. Again, Monday mornings, 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, you will see a new guest on our podcast. And then on Fridays, 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, you will see updates from us answering your questions. And yeah. If you haven't yet, check out arcingaheadapparel.com. That is our blue collar apparel line. John is not able to work anymore. At the beginning of 2023 is when we started that. So yeah, we appreciate all of your support, guys. Have a good one.